Arthroscopic treatment of calcific tendonitis of the rotator cuff. Calcific tendonitis is defined as calcification and tendon degeneration at or near the rotator cuff insertion. The prevalence is 3 to 8 percent, yet only 40 to 50 percent of patients are symptomatic. 80 percent of cases involve calcific deposits within the supraspinatus, 15 percent within the infraspinatus, and 5 percent within the subscapularis. 10 percent of cases are bilateral. Calcific tendonitis has been associated with subacromial impingement. Other risk factors include insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus and female gender, usually presenting between 40 and 60 years old. While the underlying etiology is unknown, the pathophysiology is thought to occur in three distinct phases. First, in the formative phase, cell-mediated calcification occurs where calcium crystals are deposited into matrix vesicles. During this phase, patients are generally asymptomatic. Second, is the resting phase, where fibrocartilaginous tissue encircles and isolates the calcium deposits. Finally, a resorptive phase occurs, during which patients become symptomatic. The clinical presentation of calcific tendonitis is often variable. Greater than 50% of patients are asymptomatic. If symptomatic, patients often complain of intermittent episodes of pain, similar to that of impingement syndrome. Acute episodes may be one of the most painful of all shoulder conditions. On examination, patients will often demonstrate a decreased arc of motion, most painful between 70 and 110 degrees of forward elevation and abduction, with positive subacromial impingement signs. The diagnosis is generally made by radiographs. Radiographs demonstrate the typical appearance of calcium deposits in the supraspinatus tendon proximal to the greater tuberosity. An MRI is often helpful to further elucidate the extent of the calcific tendonitis. Indications for surgery include severe, disabling, or persistent pain that interferes with activities of daily living, with symptoms lasting at least six months in duration, and in those who fail non-operative treatment. Non-operative treatment modalities include anti-inflammatories, physical therapy, corticosteroid injections, needle aspiration, or shockwave therapy. Only 10% of patients require surgery. Case 1 is a 36-year-old right-hand dominant, healthy female, a participant in triathlons and a former javelin thrower who presents with a four-year history of insidious onset right shoulder pain worse with overhead activities. She has tried and failed multiple non-operative treatment modalities, including activity modification, anti-inflammatories, and corticosteroid and PRP injections. Physical examination was notable for positive subacromial impingement signs and 5 minus out of 5 strength with isolated supraspinatus and external rotation strength testing. The AP radiograph demonstrates evidence of well-defined calcium deposits just proximal to the greater tuberosity, suggestive of calcific tendonitis. The patient was placed in the beach chair position for a right shoulder arthroscopic excision of calcific tendonitis with rotator cuff debridement versus repair. Diagnostic arthroscopy revealed that the articular surface of the rotator cuff tendon was found to be intact. All intraarticular pathology should be addressed at this time. Following an adequate subacromial decompression, the bursal side of the rotator cuff is examined. This is a view of the rotator cuff with the arthroscope in the anterolateral portal of the right shoulder. Gentle probing demonstrates that the supraspinatus tendon is softer than normal. A spinal needle is first inserted into the supraspinatus tendon to identify the area of calcification. Next, an 11-blade knife is inserted through the rotator cuff tendon in a longitudinal fashion to allow for excision of the chalky white calcium deposits. An arthroscopic shaver is then inserted into the supraspinatus tendon, and the calcium deposits are extravasated and removed from within the tendon. In this case, the calcium deposits extended into the infraspinatus tendon as well. It is important to remove all calcium deposits from within both the tendon and subacromial space, as these can be very irritating and cause significant inflammation if left behind. A curette and probe are used to ensure that all calcific deposits are removed from within the rotator cuff tendons, and the shaver is used to excise all deposits from the subacromial space. Following excision, the surgeon must decide on treatment for the remaining rotator cuff. In most cases, the calcific deposits only occupy a small portion of the rotator cuff, and simple debridement is adequate. However, in this case, 
the deposits were incorporated into the entire thickness of the supraspinatus and infraspinatus, which left a moderate-sized, full-thickness tear requiring rotator cuff repair. For moderate to large rotator cuff defects following excision of calcific tendonitis, a knotless, self-reinforcing double-row technique is utilized. With the arthroscope in the posterolateral portal, the supraspinatus footprint is debrided and lightly decorticated using a bone-cutting shaver to create a bleeding bone surface amenable for healing of the tendon. The tendon edges are debrided of any irregular tissue and the cuff is mobilized and approximated to the repair site. A knotless anchor, loaded with suture tape, is placed along the anterior aspect of the footprint, 1-2 to two millimeters lateral to the articular margin. The anchor is inserted and advanced flush to bone. A suture shuttling device is used to pass both limbs of the suture tape through the tendon approximately 1 to 1 1.5 centimeters medial to the free edge of the tendon. A second posterior anchor is placed in a similar fashion, approximately 1 1.5 centimeters posterior to the first anchor. One limb from each anchor is retrieved through the lateral portal. Soft tissue is then cleared approximately 5 to 10 millimeters lateral to the edge of the tuberosity in preparation for placement of the lateral row anchors. Both limbs are loaded through a third knotless anchor, which is then placed anteriorly, one centimeter lateral to the tuberosity. After the threaded portion of the anchor is advanced to bone, the sutures are tensioned and the anchor is seated. The free ends of the suture are then cut. This process is repeated with the remaining two limbs of suture tape to create a posterior fixation point for the lateral row. The resulting repair is self-reinforcing and interconnected, allowing for excellent repair of the rotator cuff defect. Postoperatively, the patient was allowed full, passive range of motion immediately with no resisted elbow flexion for six weeks, secondary to a concomitant biceps tenodesis. Active range of motion was initiated at the five-week mark postoperatively. Three months following surgery, the patient demonstrated pain-free, full active forward elevation, abduction, and external rotation, with 5 out of 5 strength with isolated supraspinatus and external rotation strength testing. Postoperative radiographs demonstrate successful excision of all calcium deposits proximal to the greater tuberosity. Case 2 is a 42-year-old right-hand dominant healthy active female who presents with a one and a half year history of insidious onset right shoulder pain, worse with overhead activities and lifting weights. The patient had tried and failed multiple non-operative treatment modalities, including activity modification, anti-inflammatories, and steroid injections over the past year. Radiographic views demonstrate large calcific deposits in the rotator cuff just proximal to the greater tuberosity with no other bony abnormalities. MRI delineates the calcium deposits in the supraspinatus tendon, involving approximately 90% of the supraspinatus tendon thickness, just proximal to its insertion on the greater tuberosity. With the scope in the anterolateral portal of the right shoulder, a radiofrequency probe is inserted via the posterior portal to remove the subacromial bursa and identify the region of calcification. An 11-blade knife is inserted through the rotator cuff tendon in a longitudinal fashion to allow for excision of the chalky white calcium deposits. An arthroscopic shaver is then inserted into the supraspinatus tendon and the calcium deposits are removed from within the tendon. A curette and shaver are used to ensure that all calcific deposits are removed from within the tendon and the shaver is used to remove the remaining deposits in the subacromial space. It is important to copiously lavage the joint of all calcium deposits, as leaving calcium in the joint increases the risk of postoperative stiffness and adhesive capsulitis. Following excision of the calcification, a small but complete full thickness tear of the supraspinatus tendon remained. The majority of the footprint on the greater tuberosity was left intact, and therefore the decision was made to perform a side-to-side -side repair of the interstitial split of the supraspinatus tendon. Three months postoperatively, the patient demonstrated full active and passive range of motion and was completely pain-free. The AP radiograph demonstrates complete excision of the calcific tendonitis. In the senior author's practice, 16 patients with symptomatic calcific tendonitis refractory to nonoperative treatment were followed. The minimum follow-up was two years. Results demonstrate a substantial improvement in all outcome measures at final follow-up. 
compared to each patient's preoperative status. Patient satisfaction was rated as a 10 out of 10 postoperatively by all patients, with no revisions or postoperative complications. In summary, acute episodes of calcific tendonitis may be one of the most painful of all shoulder conditions. Intraoperative technical pointers include the use of a spinal needle to localize the area of calcification. It is important to copiously lavage the joint of all calcium deposits, as leaving calcium in the joint increases the risk of postoperative stiffness and adhesive capsulitis. If a full thickness rotator cuff tear is created, this should be repaired using the surgeon's discretion for optimal repair technique. Postoperatively, an emphasis should be placed on early range of motion to prevent stiffness, one of the most common complications following arthroscopic treatment of calcific tendonitis. Thank you.